Well, there could not have been a more perfect hymn for us to sing before we look at the passage that we're going to be looking at today, because this is beyond any shadow of any doubt. The passage that we're looking at today is simply extraordinary. Uh, The title of the message is, The Day They Crucified Jesus. And I want to begin uh, by reading the passage beginning in verse 16. Our text will take us through verse 27, so we have a lot to to look at today. So uh, may the Lord, by His Spirit, give us much understanding and enlightenment um, into His Word. So John chapter 16, beginning, or John chapter 19, beginning in verse 16. So he then handed him over to them to be crucified. They took Jesus, therefore, and he went out, bearing his own cross, to the place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. There they crucified him. And with him, two other men, one on each side, and Jesus in between. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It was written, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Therefore, many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews were saying to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I've written, I've written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and made four parts, a part to every soldier, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was seamless woven in one place. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to determine whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They divided my outer garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother And his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus then saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Mother, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. This is the reading of God's inspired and infallible record of what took place that day. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father, just the reading of this passage, there's much emotion that comes sweeping over our soul and over our heart as we read again of what all our Lord undertook to secure our salvation. We are greatly humbled as we, as it were, kneel at the foot of the cross and look up and see all of this transpiring on our behalf, that it was our sins that drove him to that cross. And so, Father, today as we look at this passage, I pray that For everyone here today, that you would find us out, bring this passage home to every heart here today. May it bear some 30, some 60, some 100-fold harvest here today. I pray that you would be at work within me, that I would be simply a, a tool or an instrument for your word to go forth. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. The title of this message is The Day They Crucified Jesus. This account in the Gospel of John was written by the only gospel writer who was present at the cross, the Apostle John. 
Matthew, Mark, and Luke were not present and were dependent upon second-hand and third-hand information and resource and research in order to compile their gospel account, but not so for John. John writes as an eyewitness of the crucifixion. John was standing at the foot of the cross. John saw everything. John heard everything. In fact, Jesus even spoke to John as Jesus was dying upon the cross. And so this account that we have written here is an extraordinary account. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are equally inspired and equally infallible, but John provides us with a first-hand account. This was written some 60 years after the fact. And so for six long decades, John has been processing everything he saw and everything he heard that day. And it has been permanently etched in his mind and written upon his heart And so in the 90s, at the end of the first century, the time came for John to write this record, and it is an extraordinary record. It has dominated John's life. In fact, as we consider the Gospel of John, it's a book of 21 chapters. Seven out of those 21 are focused upon the cross or the events immediately before the cross. One-third of the gospel of John took place in less than 24 hours. And so it is with myoptic vision, it is with tunnel vision, as though looking through a keyhole, John sees this scene, and he can never forget it. He has left out so much intentionally from this fourth gospel. There's no birth account. There's no temptation account. Uh, There is no mount of transfiguration. There are no parables. There's no sermon on the mount. John has a, a, a beeline for the cross. And so as we come to this passage, we have climbed the mountain. And we have climbed Mount Everest, and we're, we're standing at the pinnacle of the Gospel of John. This is the high point of human history. And this is Jesus' reason for coming into this world, his primary reason. There are other secondary peripheral reasons But this is at the apex. This is why he came. And throughout the Gospel of John, there is this repeated refrain, it is not yet my hour. This is the hour for which he has come into the world. And so as we step back into this narrative, we step onto holy ground. That is why, as the church meets again and again and again, Jesus said we are to come to the Lord's table so that we will not forget this scene, this passage. We want to major on majors. This is major. So as we walk through this passage, and it is a very somewhat solemn passage, Yet great joy has come to us as a result of it. Several things that I want you to note. First is the condemnation. That begins in verse 16 after looking for every way possible to get out of this dilemma. Pilate now caves in to the pressure. He he has put off the Jewish leaders all that he can. He has offered Barabbas. He has said to them, I find no guilt in him. He has said it a second time, I find no guilt in him. And he realizes there's no way out of this dilemma. And so Pilate caves in to the pressure and pronounces the death sentence upon Jesus. 
Verse 16, so he, referring to Pilate, handed him over to them to be crucified. You should know that handed over is actually a somewhat technical verb that means to be handed over to judgment. And Jesus is now handed over to the judgment of the cross. He's handed over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. To be crucified was the electric chair of the first century. It was a public spectacle in front of the watching eyes of hundreds, if not thousands. It it was the gas chamber of the first century, only far worse. And Pilate now passes this death sentence and hands Jesus over to be crucified to the Roman soldiers who will carry out the dastardly deed. But in reality, it is the invisible hands of God the Father who is handing Jesus over to the cross. For this has been marked out from before the foundation of the world. Jesus is no no victim. He will be a victor. It is for this that he has come into the world. And so in verse 17, they took Jesus, therefore, and, and he went out. The Roman soldiers took Jesus away from the, the, the judgment seat and now begin the, the walk to the cross. And Jesus, it says in verse 17, went out. And never did a condemned criminal go out more willingly than did the Lord Jesus Christ. Other condemned men would put up every ounce of resistance that they could, would be cursing, but not Jesus. He is a lamb who is being led to the slaughter. It says bearing his own cross. That would be the, the, the horizontal cross beam was laid upon his shredded back. And he would carry the heavy horizontal cross beam all the way to the execution site. He would carry this though he has already been subjected to physical flogging and and beatings. Uh, He has already weakened. He has had no sleep through the six trials that that he has endured, preceded by the Garden of Gethsemane, preceded by the Upper Room Discourse. But he is a heroic figure to man up. And he bears his cross. It says to the place called the place of the skull. It is probably called the place of the skull because the skull is associated with death. And so they referred to it as the place of the skull. It was a place of shame. It was a place of humiliation. It was a place of degradation reserved for only the worst criminals in all the land. John records that it is also called in Hebrew Golgotha. It has come down to us in Latin as Calvary, which literally means a bald head like a skull or a cranium, Um, the skull of a dead man with nothing, no tissue or hair on it. And so Jesus carried his crossbeam through the city of Jerusalem winding his way some three-quarters of a mile, carrying the cross. The pathway is known as the Via Dolorosa, which means the way of sorrows. And Jesus carried his cross beam as the people of the city lined the streets. It was intended to be a, a public statement that if you rise up against Rome, this will be your fate. And so it was like a, almost like a parade as the people turned out to see this most controversial of all figures that they, they have, they, that they have ever seen now carrying his cross and it was symbolic by Rome that you are under the heel of Rome. You are under the authority of Rome as you are under this cross beam and as you are carrying it to the execution site And as Jesus approaches the city gates, on the far end, he begins to buckle 
And a man named Simon of Cyrene stepped in and carried the cross beam the rest of the way. This was an extraordinary sight. So Jesus now condemned by Pilate, condemned by the Roman Empire, is carrying his cross. And it speaks to us that if we are to be a follower of Jesus Christ, every Christian, every true believer must carry his cross. Jesus said, if anyone shall come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You cannot be a true Christian unless you are carrying your cross. And it is a cross of self-denial. It is a cross of submission not to Rome, but to the higher courts of heaven. To the Lord Jesus Christ, who is seated at the right hand of, of God the Father. We are all under the lordship of Jesus Christ, and we are following him every moment of every day as his will is unfolding for our life. So there's a cross for you to carry. And no one enters the courts of heaven above who has not carried their cross here upon the earth. It is not an option. It, it is a part of true saving faith that you carry your cross. So as you find yourself here today, and as you would look into your own heart and say, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, I want to remind you that you are carrying your cross, which is an emblem of death, death to self and death to the world. And now alive unto God and alive unto Christ Amen. as you follow Christ. That's the condemnation. And we too have been condemned because of our sins, but it is the one whom we follow has suffered our condemnation on our behalf. And the Bible says there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He carried his cross as a condemned criminal. We carry our cross as one who has no condemnation in Christ. This leads second from the condemnation to the crucifixion. It's in verse 18. Having arrived at the execution site, which was a short way outside the city gates, this grisly, horrific deed took place. Note the first four words. There they crucified him. John does not go into detail of the specifics of a crucifixion because it was so well known, because it was so public that nothing needed to be added. But let us pause just for a moment because you and I have never driven down a street in Dallas, Texas and seen someone being crucified. We've seen pictures, we've seen movies but let us just revisit what this actually is. A crucifixion was reserved for the worst of criminals, for insurrectionists, for those involved in guerrilla warfare, those trying to overthrow the government and disturb the peace. It, it, was, so, it, it was so awful that no Roman citizen could be crucified. There was too much shame associated with it. It originated in Persia. It was picked up by the Phoenicians and the Carthaginians, but it was perfected to an art form by the Romans. And it was used to intentionally keep this in front of the people in a country where they have taken over and subdued and subjected the people that this is what will happen to you if you rise up against us. It intentionally prolonged the agony of the condemned man. An electric chair, it's over just like that. The gas chamber, it's over just like that. But this was intended to take you to the very doorsteps of death, but just leave you there suspended between heaven and earth where you could not find the relief of death itself. It was a slow torture. 
It was the most vile death concocted by man. It was scandalous. It was not even fit for discussion in mixed company. And so Jesus, as he was brought to Golgotha, to Calvary, he would have been laid down on the ground face up. His arms would have been stretched out, and there the horizontal crossbeam that he had carried through the streets would have been put under him, and nails would have been driven through his wrists or possibly his forearms, and then it would be attached to the, to the vertical post, and then they would give the sign that there would be four soldiers on all four corners, and the leader would give the sign like this, and they would hoist up the cross and set it in the hole, jarring the entire body. The feet are now off the ground. The feet are nailed now upright to the, to the post, and Jesus would have begun to, to sag down and then pull up with his arms. There may have been a, a, a slight little platform built into the cross where he could push up better, not as a comfort to him, but to prolong his death. Excruciating pain would have shot up his arms. It would have caused more pain. The pain made it virtually impossible to move. His arms would have fatigued. His muscles would have cramped. And he would have had a decreasing ability to push up, to breathe, because you would sag down and take in air and then have to pull up like an Olympic gymnast in order to exhale. And it's a constant fight for air supply. The pectoral muscles would eventually become paralyzed. No one can keep this up indefinitely. And air would be drawn into the lungs but cannot be exhaled without pulling up. And Jesus would have fought to raise himself up for yet another gasp of air. Carbon dioxide would have built up in his lungs and in the blood supply. His gasp for air would have shortened and, and shortened. More cramps would have come, asphyxiation. The tissue on his back would be torn from, from it really lacerated. Every time he pulls up and down the rough timber on his back, until finally the sac around the heart, the pericardium, would begin to fill with, with, with fluid to, to try to be some buffer to the heart because the heart is beating and pounding at a, an extraordinary rate until the pericardium that is filled with this fluid begins to comp compress upon the heart. That's why when they thrust the spear through his side and water came gushing, gushing out, it was from this buffer around the heart until finally he could not pull up anymore. This struggle went on and on for hours. There they crucified him. Let us not just pass that by. The struggle that he undertook to be steadfast, to go all the way, to pay the price for your sin and for mine. And it says, with him, two other men. And we know who one of them was. It was Barabbas. He's mentioned in the last verse of the previous chapter. Barabbas, who was the single most hated public figure in all of, of, of Palestine, a, a treasonous, insurrectionist murderer. He's on one side, and whoever was on the other side would be equally um, condemned and Jesus now in the middle, and it just adds to the shame, just the guilt by association, as Jesus now being crucified between the two worst men in the whole land. Yet this was intentional by God the Father, for it had been prophesied in Isaiah 53, verse 12, he would be numbered with the transgressors. He, he, he would go down unto death with the worst that society and the worst that this world had to offer. 
He was, they were one on either side, Jesus in between. This is quite a scene. And the only people today who can even begin to understand what all Jesus went through are those who are, who are already the damned in hell. Because the greatest suffering was not the physical suffering. Countless hundreds, even thousands of, of men were, were crucified. Jesus was just one of those who was crucified. It is that Jesus was the only one who bore the sins of his people. As God the Father transferred all of the sins of all of the people who would ever believe on him were imputed and transferred to the Lord Jesus Christ. And in 1 Peter 2 verse 20, 24, it says that he bore our sins in his body. What a shock to his system that must have been. Him who knew no sin, the, the Holy One of, of Israel, now becoming sin, but not just becoming sin, but becoming the composite sin of the world of all who would ever put their trust in him in a moment. And as he bore our sins, God the Father crushed him. God the Father brought the full weight of the law and the full weight of his wrath down heavy upon his son. And Isaiah 53 said, it pleased the father to crush him. What an extraordinary death he died. This leads to the inscription, verse 19. Pilate also wrote an inscription. Uh, the inscription would be the accusation. The, the inscription would be the charge. That's how it's referred to in Matthew 27, 37. It's the charge. And so Pilate has the charge written on a placard, a small board, and then to have that nailed at the head of the vertical beam which was a statement of his guilt it says and put it on the cross he did this to infuriate the Jews this is your king and we read it was written Jesus the Nazarene he, he added the Nazarene can any good thing come from Nazareth? John 1, 46? The answer is no. Nazareth was the other side of the tracks. Nazareth was the, the lowest of the low. Nazareth was the scum of the earth. Nazareth was the outcast. Na to come from Nazareth was the most despicable point of origin. And Pilate puts that on the inscription. Again, compounding the, the shame and the humiliation of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he does it intentionally to provoke the Jews. To kind of have one last word with the Jews. To kind of let the door hit them on their way out. Jesus the Nazarene. That's the best you have to offer. The king of the Jews. And Jesus has already claimed to be a king. He did that in the previous chapter as we saw. But this was also meant to ridicule the Jews. The Jewish leaders. Verse 20. Therefore many of the Jews read the inscription. And this probably refers to more than just the leaders it refers to the vast numbers of people that are, that are gathering around, but also this crucifixion site is on, a, is on a small hill that overlooks one of the main highways that lead into Jerusalem, and this is the Passover season, and so there are hundreds, maybe thousands of people trafficking by this execution site 
and they're reading this inscription. It says, for the place where Jesus was crucified was, was near the city. That means it was outside the city. Those who would be crucified were considered to be of such nothingness that they couldn't even be crucified inside the city for fear it would defile or contaminate uh, the life of the city. So they would take them out of town like taking the trash out of town to a dump heap. And there to, to crucify Jesus outside the city. Just a footnote, that was the legislation passed by Charles II with the Puritans. That they were not even allowed to come back into any city. They had to live at least five miles outside of any city. And when they died, John Owen, John Bunyan, Isaac Watts, the greatest of Christians, they had to be buried outside the city. And it was a statement of utter rejection and hatred and disdain. It's a place called Bunhill Fields in London. And so, in like manner, Jesus is crucified out where they take the trash. And it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. Pilate wanted the world to know. Pilate wanted everyone to know, and this is another attempt just to rub it, the dirt into the face of the Jewish leaders and the Jewish people. He had it written in Hebrew because this represented the Jewish world of religion. He had it written in Latin because it represented the Roman world of politics and power. He had it written in Greek because it represented the Greek world of culture and, and commerce. It was an across-the-board statement to the world. Jesus the Nazarene, King of the Jews. And so as Jesus was crucified outside the city, I do want you to know in order for you to be a follower of Christ, you're going to have to go outside the city. Not geographically, but spiritually. Because you're no longer a part of the system. And two verses that are so extraordinarily important... Hebrews 13, verses 12 and 13, beg to be read at this point, and is so important for your spiritual life and for my spiritual life, I'm even going to turn to it and just read it. Hebrews 13, verses 12 and 13, therefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people through his blood, referring to the blood that he shed upon Calvary's cross, suffered outside the gate. Okay, we've got that. We understand the geography of that and the meaning why it was outside the gate. It was an utter rejection by, by the world of the one who was being crucified. But notice the next verse, verse 13. This speaks to me. This speaks to you. Verse 13, so let us go out to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. If you want to have Jesus, you can't stay on the easy path of this world. If you want Jesus, you cannot remain on the broad path with the many. If you want Jesus, you're going to have to leave the world, the evil world system, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, you're going to have to leave the world and go out where Jesus was crucified and stand with him and bear his reproach and bear his shame. You're going to have to fly your flag at high mast 
for the world to see and to suffer whatever may come. James 4, verse 4 says, do you not know? In other words, if you're breathing, you know this. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? How strange does that sound? James 4, verse 4. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Whoever makes himself to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. You can't have it both ways. You're going to have to decide who's your master. It's either Jesus or the world. So, what are you going to live for? Who are you going to live for? You can't straddle the fence. You can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't play all ends into the middle. You can't sit in the middle. Is it Jesus or the world? And perhaps there's some here today who are living for the world. And you think coming to church and just uh, hearing the Word puts you in good stead with Jesus. No, it doesn't. It actually adds to your condemnation because you're hearing the truth. You're going to have to burn your bridges behind you and come all the way to Jesus. When I was in high school many years ago, my youth group used to sing a song goes like this. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Second verse. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back. No turning back. I think we've got too many people who want the cross and the world before them. And it doesn't work that way. And then the next verse. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back. No turning back. As a young boy, 17 years old, I said, Lord, that's going to be me. The world will be behind me, and the cross will be before me. No turning back. No turning back. It is very significant that Jesus was crucified outside the city. And that if you are to stand with Jesus and follow Jesus and have Jesus and be a believer in Jesus, you're going to have to burn your bridges behind you and come all the way to Jesus or you'll not have Jesus. The one who issues the call sets the terms and these are the terms. So notice fourth, the objection and John, back in John 19, verse 21, the objection. Th- this infuriated the Jews. I mean, this is provoking their unconverted flesh to no end. So verse 21, so the chief priests of the, of, of the Jews were saying to Pilate, they, they begin to lobby Pilate, they, they bring more pressure on Pilate, they, they, they have already squeezed Pilate into their mold. They've already manipulated Pilate to bring the death sentence. They, they, they want to now put their hand in his glove and control him yet further. Do not write the king of the Jews. They protested. They pushed back. He's not our king. But instead that he said, I am king of the Jews. He only said it, but he, he is not our king. And Pilate, with the stubbornness of his hardened heart, answered back, what I have written, I have written. I mean, I mean, this is flesh meets flesh. This is unconverted carnality meets unconverted carnality. And Pilate, for the first time, bows his back. 
and stands up to the Jews and says, no, what I've written is going to stay there. And we see that in the world all around us, do we not? Unconverted flesh confronting unconverted flesh. That's the story of the United States today. And the only hope is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because it is an absolute stalemate of reprobates. So fifth, the confiscation. Verse 23, the confiscation. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and made four parts. This was customary that the soldiers who performed the execution were able to divide up the clothing of the one whom they have crucified. And so there were four parts to Jesus' outer garments. It would have been an outer garment, which would have been like a coat. It would have been a belt. It would have been sandals. And it would have been a head covering. And so as Jesus is dying on the cross, they are splitting up the booty at the foot of the cross, completely oblivious to who this is that is dying there, though it is written plain as day, King of the Jews. But there was another piece. So we go on to read, or a part to every soldier. That's why we know there were four soldiers, because they divided up the four parts. And then also a tunic, which was like the undergarment that would be worn next to the skin. And now the tunic was seamless and woven in one piece. So we need to understand this at this point. Jesus is now naked. He, he, th- this adds to the shame and the humiliation that he is now suspended between heaven and earth, hanging on a cross, struggling for his next life's breath. He has not one stitch of clothing on. His own mother is standing there at the foot of the cross. He is an adult male. The, the, the humiliation of this whole scene knows no end. And we have to be reminded of Adam, who, who was naked. And after he sinned, he was aware of his nakedness and took fig leaves and tried to cover himself up. Jesus, now the second Adam, bears the shame of, that Adam bore in order that he might clothe you and me with his perfect righteousness, that there would be a perfect covering for our sins so that as we stand before God, though we still continue to sin every day, we have been clothed with the perfect righteousness of Christ and the Father sees only the righteousness of Christ. Jesus became naked so that you and I could be clothed. Think about that. And so verse 24, so they said to one another, the soldiers collaborating, let us not tear it. In other words, we don't want to tear this tunic that is seamless. We don't want to rip it up and tear it into four parts. That's not going to do any of us any good. So let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide whose it shall be. And so they cast the lots to see who would get the tunic. And all of this is being orchestrated by God the Father. And John wants us to know this, that this whole passage has sovereignty of God written all over it. Yes, there is human responsibility here, but there's also divine sovereignty. And God the Father is orchestrating this whole scene, and John writes here, quoting the Old Testament He said, they divided my outer garments. He's quoting Psalm 22, verse 18, which, by the way, is one of the most messianic psalms in the entire Psalter. 
In fact, Psalm 22 is the one that begins verse 1 that Jesus cries out while he's on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which leads us to believe Jesus is meditating on Scripture to draw strength while he's hanging on the cross, and he is fully aware that he is fulfilling the eternal purpose and plan of God the Father for his life and for the salvation of his people. Everything is on track. He's just got to gut it out. And so John records now this psalm. Psalm 22, verse 18, they divided my outer garments among them, and for my clothing they, they cast lots. And we need to understand this too. These prophecies are not being fulfilled by Jesus' disciples who have the most to gain by the fulfillment. These prophecies are being fulfilled by Jesus' enemies who have the most to lose by their fulfillment. And they're being fulfilled by people who don't even know God, don't even know Christ. I think of Proverbs 21, verse 1, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. Like rivers of water, he channels it whichever way he will. The grand puppet master in heaven. The great potter over his clay. And so... We see the sovereignty of God here, interwoven with the human responsibility of man. Someone once asked Charles Haddon Spurgeon, how do you reconcile human responsibility and divine sovereignty? And Spurgeon said, I never need to reconcile friends. They've never had a falling out. They are the best of friends. So this leads us now to the last heading, the dedication. The second line in verse 25, in the midst of this horrific death scene, here's what's amazing. Jesus is not focused on himself. I would have been. You would have been. He wasn't focused on himself. He was focused on God the Father. And he was focused upon others. The first two sayings from the cross, by the way, what John records from the mouth of Jesus is really only the third saying The first saying was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The second saying was, today you will be with me in paradise. (laughs) There's just a fountain of, of grace that is flowing from the cross already before he even ascends to the right hand of God the Father. Just grace upon grace. But now comes the third saying from the cross the first to be recorded by John. And what John wants us to see is how devoted Jesus was to his own mother. And there's something for us to learn here. So in verse 25, but standing by the cross, the idea is just like at the foot of the cross, right by it, were four women. And men, let me just say this, the women are always there. The disciples, the shepherd has been struck and the sheep have scattered and only John is here. John and four women. There may be some more women. How how strong women are in their faith. Or his mother, that's Mary, and Mary knows the whole truth about who he is. She bore him for nine months. His mother's sister, who by the way is the mother of James and John, she was married to Zebedee. Mary, the wife of Clopas, who is the mother of another one of the disciples, James the Lesser. One of the disciples couldn't even hang in there, but his mother does. 
And Mary Magdalene, Jesus had cast out of her seven demons. Her life has been so radically changed and transformed from darkness to light, she'll follow Christ to the gates of hell and back. Verse 26, when Jesus then saw his mother, he, he, he gazed upon his mother. He locked in upon his mother. And the disciple whom he loved, that's John. John is so humbled that he has been chosen to write these verses that he will not even refer to himself by his first name. I'm just over here in the shadows. I'm not in the spotlight. I'm just the disciple whom Jesus loved. When Jesus then saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby at the foot of the cross, he said to his mother, woman, which is a, a, a title of respect. Behold your son. Jesus is caring for his mother as he dies upon the cross. Jesus is obeying the Ten Commandments as he's dying upon the cross. The fifth commandment says, honor your father and mother. It is put in that strategic place between the first four and the last five. It's the bridge between the first four. You'll have no other gods before me, not take the Lord's name in vain, etc. And then the last five, it's my relationship with God, the first four, then my relationship with everyone else, the last six, but it's this fifth commandment, Exodus 20, verse 12, that is in the strategic position from loving God to loving men, your mother and your father are positioned at that intersection. They are the pivotal figures in your life. They are to be, your father and your mother are to be the most influential people in your life to direct you in your relationship with God and in your relationship with others. And so even as Jesus is hanging on the cross, he is, he is obedient to the word of God unto the end. He is honoring his mother. His father, no doubt, has already passed away. Joseph, there's no mention of him any, any longer. And I also think of 1 Timothy 5, verse 8, that says, if a man will not take care of his own household, he's worse than an infidel. Not just an infidel, worse than an infidel. And I don't know where you are in your relationship with your mother. But you better love your mother. You better care for your mother. And other than God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, there may not be a more precious, proper name than mother and father. And as Jesus is hanging on the cross. His concern is for the care of his mother. You would have to be a total reprobate, a devil, not to care for your mother. Verse 27, we're finished. Then he said to the disciple, referring to John, Behold your mother. I'm stepping out, you step in. You become a son to her. You attend to her needs. Joseph is not around. And Jesus was the eldest son 
And it was the responsibility of the eldest son to care for his mother. And so Jesus is a dutiful son. And Mary was not perfect. She was a sinner like everyone else. There was no immaculate conception with Mary. But despite her sin, and despite her imperfections, Jesus loved his mother unto his death. From that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. The word household is not in the original. It's been added by the translator. It just literally reads, and John took her into his own, into his own heart, into his own arms, into his own life. What a Savior. As he is suffering under the brutality of men, enduring this for the salvation of you and me, he remains tender hearted toward his own mother. As I bring this to conclusion, let us not forget why he's there. He's there for you and for me. He's not there for himself. He's there to bear our sins and to be the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. He is there as our scapegoat to take our sins into the wilderness of God's forgetfulness, never to be seen again. He is there to take our sins and bury them in the sea of God's forgetfulness. He is there to take our sins and place them behind his back where they will be seen no more. He is there that the Father would remember our sins no more. This is the heart of the gospel. This is the heart of Christianity. And so I just have to ask you, have you ever believed in Jesus Christ? Have you ever crossed the line? Have you ever turned your back to the world? Have you ever stepped out of the crowd? Have you ever said no to the pleasures of sin, to turn to Christ and believe upon Him as your Lord and Savior? If you have never done that, I call for the verdict. I call for the verdict of your heart. Will you believe in this dying Savior who suffered bearing the sin of sinners and suffering under the wrath of God? I was talking to Kent Steinbeck this week about gospel preaching. And we were talking about issuing the call. And Kent said to me, when you're in business and you make the presentation, you then have to ask for the order. You've heard the presentation. On behalf of Christ, I'm asking for the order. I'm calling for the verdict. Will you believe in this crucified Savior who says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Come to Christ who says, Him who comes unto me I will in no wise cast out. Save your excuses. Just throw yourself upon his mercy. He is the friend of sinners. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that 
John has recorded this, we would not know much of this except that you chose John to be called away from those fishing nets and to follow Christ for three years and to follow him all the way to the cross. Thank you that we can read this and have a better grasp of that 24-hour period of time that John locks in on. May we be riveted upon Christ this day. In his name we pray. Amen.